Hello everyone, my name is Jeremy. Welcome to Mountain View Church. We are so glad that you've decided to join us today. Oh, oops, uh, forgot that I still had my costume on. I'm just so excited about Candy Palooza, so excited to dress up. Um, what's Candy Palooza? Oh, it is amazing, but I can't spoil it. Uh, I, I have to let Miss Megan tell you all about it in the kids' moment. Uh, for now, I kind of got to stick to what I got to do. I just want to take a few moments to speak to those who are maybe new to Mountain View Church and the ways you can connect. First, if you're gathering digitally, you can click the connect link at mountainviewwhitehorse.ca or text connect to the number on the screen. If you're in a physical gathering uh, and you'd like to connect with Mountain View Church, there is a card under the seat in front of you. Simply fill it out, hand it into the welcome desk, and someone will be in touch with you. Lastly, would you consider supporting our church? As we move forward and approach the holiday season, we have a ton of plans and projects to bless our community and reach people for Jesus. Even just a small tax-deductible donation can have a huge impact. Simply click the Give link at mountainviewwhitehorse.ca or text Give to the number on the screen. And if you're gathering with us physically, it's really easy. There's an envelope under the seat in front of you. You can put your donation in there, fill out the front for your tax receipt, and put it in the lockbox at the back of the auditorium. Thank you so much for choosing to be a part of Mountain View, and thank you for giving and supporting our ministries. Now, here's Miss Megan with this week's Kids Moment and information about Candy Palooza. Good morning. We have had two successful weeks of base camp, and I just want to say let's do a round of applause for everyone who has helped make this happen. And let's give praise to our Lord as we continue to teach children about Jesus and what he has done for us. Now, parents, please, to keep this rolling, I need you to fill out a volunteer form, which you can find on our website. Then I need you to sign up for one Sunday a month. As we see more families return to church, which is so exciting, this means we also need more volunteers downstairs. So, Please take a moment, fill out the form, send me an email to megan at mountainviewwhitehorse.ca and pick one Sunday a month. We will continue to have our base camp program running during the 9.30 gathering. Then during the 11 o'clock gathering, it will be a parent-led space. If you're not able to make it to either gathering, you won't miss out because all of our lessons and materials can be found on our website which is mountainviewwhitehorse.ca slash basecamp. So be sure to check it out. Now, on to the big reveal of Candy Palooza. So like I mentioned last week, this is a major community outreach opportunity with the children's ministry. Next Sunday, things might look a little different, but don't let looks fool you. We will still continue with our normal lessons downstairs, but we're going to add a few twists. First, come dressed up. Wait, what? Yes, kids, come dressed up. Next Sunday, come dressed up. To be clear, I will be judge and jury on what is appropriate. Nothing scary or offsides. I will make last minute adjustments if I need to. So think about like superhero, ninja, princess. I call dibs on cowgirl, animals. I mean, you get the idea. Okay, second, we will keep with the same rotation, but when you rotate into the main room, each group will have their very own crazy fun game to play. Now I'll let you dream up what that will be. Then third, well, this is called Candy Palooza. So yes, we will give out candy. At the end, every kid will receive a goodie bag. It's gonna be amazing. Okay, a couple things. If you know that you are going to be doing church at home on next Sunday, but still wanna partake in Candy Palooza, that's great. Email me before October 29th and goodie bags can be brought to you. You do the dress up and we'll supply you with the goodie bags and the lessons. 
Now the game portion of it, I'll leave that up to you. So be sure to email me, megan at mountainviewwhitehorse.ca so you can join in on Candy Palooza. So what do you do next? Invite your friends and neighbors. Have your kids talk about it at school, at the park. You know, it could go something like this. Dude, you wanna to come to church with me on Sunday? Hmm, I don't know, buddy. Hey, you can come dressed up, we'll play games and get candy. Uh, yeah, I'm in. See, it's simple. Okay, so remember, this is a major community children's outreach opportunity. So let's all work together to capitalize on getting families and kids here next Sunday. Now I've talked way too much. Thank you so much for listening and have a great week. Hello again, this is Nancy, reminding you once again about Operation Christmas Child. It was so encouraging last week to see so many of you picking up one, two, or even three boxes to fill. That's great. Again, please remember, no breakable, leakable, or meltable items, and as you will see, removing unnecessary packaging helps too. For a very quick tip on the types of things you could include in your box, take a look. Stay focused. This goes really fast. Thanks. Hello everyone, Mark Shore here with a special announcement. October is Pastor Appreciation Month, and on behalf of our board, I would like to extend to our pastor, Jeremy Norton, our pastor apprentices, Aaron Moness, and Elijah Ischenko, a sincere message of appreciation for their service here at Mountain View Church. They are a great group of men that are serving here and we want to acknowledge them. Thank you so much for your service. Encourage each of you to show your appreciation in the coming weeks to our pastoral staff. I'd like to encourage each one of you to take an opportunity over the next few weeks and to express to them a word of encouragement and a word of appreciation for their service. Also, I would like to recognize the families of our pastors and for uh, Nicole and the boys and for Elizabeth and their little one as they truly support their husbands as co-workers in the ministry. Thank you so much. May you be blessed this week and by this service today.
God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome and power. Our God, our God. If our God is for us, who could ever stop us? If our God is with us, then what could stand against? If our God is for us, who could ever stop us? If our God is with us, then what could stand against? What could stand against? My 
should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer. This I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. Jesus of Nazareth. What do you even think about when you hear that? He is the most interesting figure in the history of the world. The biggest influencer, we might say. And that's who we are going to explore. But this whole study, in the end, is actually almost even more so, not just about Jesus, but about you. What you do with the most important person who ever lived and how it defines your life now. And I know this sounds crazy, for the next billion years. Eternity is what's in the balance when we're talking about Jesus. What we do with him defines the fate of everyone who has ever lived. And that is not an overstatement. Mark 8, 34 to 38. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Ask the average person sitting in a coffee shop or out doing some grocery shopping, who was Jesus? You'll get a variety of answers, a good moral teacher, a prophet, a revolutionary, or as we discussed last week, he never existed. If that would be your answer, you definitely want to hit pause and go back to last week's teaching. We talk all about he never existed. What if you ask that same person, what did he require of his followers? Some might say to love others or give to the poor, which would be true in part, but many would have no idea. Not really. Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross, his execution, his death, and follow me. This is a very costly request for some moral teacher or a prophet. Mark Clark puts it this way in his book, The Problem of Jesus. This doesn't sound like a good pitch for winning followers. Over the last 2,000 years, this call of discipleship has become infamous, and for good reason. But before we can grasp what it meant, and by extension, what it means for us, we have to understand why this threefold invitation, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me, was and is something we need. What happens to be the worst strategy for pursuing our personal fulfillment may actually be the best thing for us. Today, we're going to be focusing on Jesus' call to discipleship and loving God. We're in week two of our series, Challenges to Christianity 2.0. A few years ago, we did our first Challenges to Christianity series using the Bible and a book by Pastor Mark Clark from Village Church called The Problem of God. Now, Pastor Mark has released a second book, The Problem of Jesus, centered around the Son of God, Jesus, the Messiah, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. And so we're doing a 2.0 series, again, centered on Scripture, but also using some highlights from his book, The Problem of Jesus. You're going to want a copy of the Bible, a print copy or a Bible app. If you don't have a Bible, you can text the number on the screen and we will send you one. Uh, you can also, if you want, download a copy of The Problem of Jesus, ebook, maybe audiobook, or maybe you want a physical copy. If you're in-house, you can get one at our welcome desk. Uh, another side note before we get started here, some of you in-house in our 930 gathering are probably wondering where I am because you're watching me via video. I'm actually in the building, but I'm downstairs. It's actually my week in our base camp children's program. 
since we've relaunched our children's program, it's tough to get volunteers. And so we're calling all parents, including this guy who has three children, to serve at least one Sunday a month. And so today happens to be my week. So I'm downstairs teaching the elementary students, I think, and it should be really fun, and you're watching me over video. And so if you are a parent, we would strongly encourage you, if possible, please, 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 pick one Sunday a month and help us disciple your children downstairs in base camp. That would be awesome. Or serve in another area. Any area is fine. We just want to make sure that everyone is doing their part, picking a role, serving, and using your gifts and abilities for Jesus, for the church. All right. If you're new to Mountain View Church, though, please just sit back, relax, grab some coffee or tea, and let's just go along for the ride. Okay, let's get started here. So discipleship and loving God. Where we need to start is why bother? Because maybe you're wondering, like, what's the deal with discipleship, loving God, why do I care? And if you're maybe atheist, agnostic, this isn't something you're really concerned about or thinking about but it's important. Why? Because of the default setting of humanity. The default setting of humanity, whether you believe it or not, is love yourself, take up your life, and follow your heart. Now, maybe you don't like this idea of loving yourself and you push against it here and there, but when we get down to the bottom of this, you'll see that it is really on self-care, follow your heart, self-love, and, you know, take up your own life, live your adventure. And we can see this in a number of ways because it's different for all of us. Let me just throw out a bunch of stuff that one of these is probably going to center around your life and what you love and what you cherish. But let's look at these. For example, we have relationships and sex, money and possessions, career and status, children and family, justice and activism, race and gender, travel and experiences, popularity and social, health and wellness, comfort and recreation, law and order, knowledge and education, freedom and democracy, peace and unity, planet and environment, rules and religion, and the list goes on. Fill in the blank. But almost every one of us fits into one of those categories, and maybe for you it's something totally different. But all of these things are good things. We all have them. And God has given many of these things as gifts to us. And, and following them is not so bad in a sense. They're not bad things. They're good things, but they consume us. All of humanity is consumed by one or a couple of those things. And here's what I mean. Again, pick one of those things that is really your important thing. That's your thing. And you'll, you'll think about it, process it, and you'll want other people to care about it too. And you might even say, if, if I could just get more of this, or if more of this could happen, if other people could just join in and care about this, you know, however you word it, your process or your default is life would get better. And you're so in love with this thing. You're so focused on this thing. This is your thing and maybe a good thing. But what happens is the end of it doesn't actually exist. It goes on and on and on. And you constantly strive to get the best of this thing or get other people to love this thing as much as you, but it never ends. Then we move to Jesus. Jesus' call to humanity is the complete opposite. He actually says to deny yourself. Then he says, take up your cross, which is execution, death, instead of taking up your life or taking up the good life, he says, take up your cross, eventually how he died, a torturous death. And then he says, and follow me. Don't follow your heart. Don't follow you. Don't lean into you. He says, follow him, lean into him. And so at the start, you're like, well, what does that actually mean? But, but what Jesus does is in discipleship to Jesus, he calls us to give up something good now for something great later. Okay. Jesus in his discipleship is calling us to give up something good now or lay down something good now for something great later. We have a great example of this in the gospel of Matthew in chapter 19. Now the situation here is there's a rich young man and he wants to follow Jesus. He wants to be one of Jesus' disciples and, and he's He's lived a good life. He's actually been a really good guy. And um, he's followed all the commandments. He, yeah, he's just been a really good guy. And so Jesus responds this way to his request to, to be one of his disciples. 
in uh, verse 21 of chapter 19, here's what Jesus says. If you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. And then it says this, when the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. And then Jesus turns to his disciples and says, truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. And then a little further down, Jesus expands on this more. He says, truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. You see the problem most people have uh, maybe all of us have, is understanding what Jesus asks for, truly, and also what Jesus offers. See, we often mistake, it's like, oh, well, he's just asking to feed the poor, just to love other people. Well, no, it's more than that. It's, it's giving up everything to follow Jesus. And, and we miss that fully, but we also miss what he offers in the next life, which is the eternal life, billions of years. So we give up in the physical life, for the eternal life. And so we give up something good in order to receive something great, something unimaginable, really. And, and, but maybe you're wondering, like, how is this possible? Like, how can anyone achieve this? It, it really seems just crazy. And even the disciples themselves thought, this is impossible. How can this really work? Well, we can start to understand discipleship with Jesus once we understand uh, that discipleship is not just a Christian thing, it's a human thing. I'm going to say that again. Discipleship is not just a Christian thing. Discipleship is a human thing, and it's centered around who or what we love. And what I'm talking about is that everyone is being discipled by uh, following someone or something they love. And ultimately, what Jesus is calling to is instead of following that other person, that other thing, and giving everything over to that or them and, and loving that, he's calling us to follow him. And eventually, we're going to get to loving God. And how can we know whether or not we're discipled by someone else or something? How, how do you know that you're actually being discipled by something or someone? Well, you just need to look at this. Think about your beliefs. Uh, think about your desires. Think about your habits and behaviors. They will always follow what you love. And often they're, they're good things that kind of become corrupted. You know, that list we had from before, most of us really believe, desire, we, we really behave in that realm, we crave that realm of those things, we just love them. And when these good things become the center of our attention, they get corrupted and they become what the Bible talks about as idols. They become an idol. Any of those good things can become an idol and they become the center of our attention and the center of our affection. So maybe for one person, they might hate capitalism or careerism, okay? The desire to like work hard and climb the corporate ladder and make tons of money and, and, and achieve in the workplace. And, and maybe for you, uh, you just hate that. And, and you're like, yeah, that's totally an idol. And you're totally on board with that, that, that someone can be so wrapped up in it that it can become uh, such a center of their life that it becomes an idol. But here's the catch, is that on the other side, maybe uh, activism or self-care instead. You know, maybe you say, I don't, I don't work for the man, I don't work for capitalism, careerism, you know, I work for myself, and, and maybe you have more of a holistic understanding, and you follow experiences, or, or maybe you want to fight for social justice or the poor, and, and some sort of activism that way. That, too, can become an idol. 
You see, on either end, it just depends what you love, where your attention and affection lies. They both can become idols. They can become so central to everything you are that you get lost in it. And you want the entire world to care about that thing too, but it never will. There's no end to it. You will never achieve enough. You will never get enough. And you will never convince other people to love it as much as you do. And it's fleeting. In the problem of Jesus, Mark Clark adds to this thought, the way to disengage the heart from the love of one great object is to fasten it to another. It's not about exposing the worthlessness of the old affection, but exposing the worth and excellence of the new one. More than just saying or believing that your idols are destructive, you must come to believe that God is better. Taste and see that the Lord is good. You see, loving God becomes the key factor in discipleship. You, you can't just add God on the side. It can't be an equal thing to whatever your thing is that you love and that you have great affection for. It is that it has to transform into loving God more than all those things. And this is why Jesus, when asked what the greatest commandment was, Jesus responded and he said, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. That, that truly pouring everything we have into loving God helps us leave those good things in the place where they're supposed to be. They're still good things and we can still care about them, but it prevents them from becoming our idols. It prevents them from becoming the central thing and it, it prevents them from fully corrupting our life. God is supposed to be at the top and all those other good things are always fighting for the top spot and actually our corrupt humanity is trying to push them there or pull them there. And so that's the defense, that's, that's the discipleship and loving God peace. And, and so how can we start this journey? Well, we need to ask ourselves a tough question and, and we need to ask what good thing have we exchanged for loving God? Okay, what good thing have we exchanged for loving God? And, and the Apostle Paul talked about this to the Roman church when he, when he explained how this happens. In Romans 1, 21 to 23, he, he wrote this. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, and birds, and animals, and creeping things. Paul is talking about idolatry but in the ancient world, that people then would exchange the good things God's created, either other humans, animals, and, and they would start worshiping idols or images of those, and they would start thinking of those as greater than God who created them, exchanging good things for God. And, and so this is in the ancient world, but today it's, it's a little bit different, but the principle is the same. So we need to ask, what do idols look like in our modern Western context? We, we might not worship uh, actual statues of human beings and, and animals anymore, but we still have those things that our full attention and affection fall on. And, and so it's almost a, a little bit more difficult in this moment. Our good things aren't always visual and physical to see. But if we're honest with ourselves, we need to ask, what have we exchanged in our attention and affection, our love for the immortal God? Does the immortal God have top spot in our life or not? And if he doesn't, that might be the reason why we're never finding fulfillment, where our life is never enough and why we're constantly in that default setting of, if I could just have a little bit more blank, life would get better. If I could just do a little bit more blank, life would get better. If people could just blank, life would get better. Constantly chasing something that'll never be there. And so humanity is in this perpetual problem of turning good things into God things. And this is part of our sin nature. We're fallen. Each one of us is doomed to focus on ourselves unless we accept God's plan through Jesus. Now, before we close, I wanna do something a little different. 
I want us to pause for a moment. I'm actually going to leave a whole minute. There'll be a bit of background music, but I want all of us to reflect a little bit. I'm going to put up uh, that slide again of, of, of all those good things, you know, and, and, you know, that one at the bottom where it was just blanks. I want us to reflect on those and ask the hard question, where is my attention and affection? What on this list do I love? What on this list do I chase, do I crave? What on this list consumes my mind most of my life? What, what on this list do people know that I talk about all the time? What on this list craves my attention and affection all the time? Because answering that question leads us to understand that maybe, just maybe, we've created an idol that will not fulfill us and that it's really all about us, that we're at the center and Jesus' call to deny ourselves and to put those good things a little lower and put God higher might just be the answer to our problem. So let's look at this list and ask some hard questions of ourselves. So you've had a bit of time to look at that list. And maybe you realize, I'm chasing one of these things, and it's going nowhere. This leads us to the next set of questions. That instead of chasing that thing, instead of loving that thing, instead of leaning into that thing, should I try loving God instead? Should I try putting God at the top? instead. And if so, then understanding that God's plan was to send his son Jesus for us to follow, should I try following Jesus instead of following the people related to this thing or this thing as a whole, this good thing that I've made a God thing? You see, God loved you so much and he knew that you can't make it on your own, that you're constantly just going to be chasing stuff that won't fulfill you. And so he loved you enough that he sent his son Jesus to teach a new way, God's way. And they would hate him for it. They would hate his message so much that they would put him on a cross. But that was all part of the plan. Because on that cross, the sin of the world, all the wrong, all the idols fell on him. And he took the punishment. You see, because our sin and our idolatry and all the wrong we have, our self-centeredness, our default setting, it separated us from a holy God. And so Jesus became the sacrifice so that we might be perfect. And he died on that cross and he was buried, but he rose on the third day, the resurrection. And in that resurrection, he conquered sin, he conquered death, and has made a way for anyone who believes in him, who follows him, might have eternal life. That we get an abundant life now, we get a fulfilling life now, but that we have an eternal life. Not only does it make the good things better because they're now in their place as just good gifts of God under his authority, under his love, but then in the next life when our body, our shell disappears, we live on, our soul moves on. Following Jesus leads to eternity with God. You see, that's discipleship. That's the gospel. That's what loving God gets us. We find Jesus. We follow Jesus. We have the opportunity to everlasting eternal life. Before I pray for you, I just want to read one more thing that Mark Clark writes. Over and over again, we see a consistent theme. People reject Jesus and his ways. Not accepting Jesus was the norm and still is today. The default setting of the human heart is a rejection of Jesus' authority over our lives. And his proposed remedy to the rejection 
deny yourself, pick up your cross, follow me. Never have there been three more radical, yet life-giving, invitations set before humankind. If you would like to start loving God, if you would like to start following Jesus, if you would like to accept His call to deny self, take up your cross, and follow Him, I want to give you an opportunity right now. We're going to pray, and wherever you are, this is where it starts. Putting God first, following Jesus first. And you can pray right now and start a totally new life that actually never ends. Let's pray. Dear Father, I thank you for sending your son Jesus. I thank you that you loved us enough that you didn't leave us to be lost, but that you sent Jesus to die for our sin, our idolatry, our our human default of centering around our stuff and, and turning the good gifts you've given us into idols. And that Jesus took that sin on the cross and paid the punishment for it paid the penalty so that we might be perfect. And Father, I thank you that Jesus didn't stay dead, but rose from the grave, conquering sin and death, making a way for humans to access you, the immortal, eternal God, and that we might live in eternity through Jesus. Father, for those listening right now, for those watching, may they take this step to put you first, and to follow Jesus, that they might start a new life to find true fulfillment and stop chasing all the good things so much and so far and so deep that they've become false idols, false gods. May we all try Jesus today. May we all follow Jesus today and follow your plan into eternity. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You hold the reins on the sun and the moon Like horses driven by kings You cover the mountains and the valleys below With the breath of Treasures of wisdom and things to be known are hidden inside your hands. In this fortunate turn of events, you've asked me to be your friend. You asked me to be.
Before you go, I do have a couple discussion questions for you because the learning doesn't just stop after listening to this video. We want you to keep growing, keep learning, and dig into this on your own or with other people. So if you're online right now, you can put some comments in the feed, you can email us, message us the answers to these questions of what you think, or have a conversation online with other people that are watching. If you're gathering in a home right now with friends or family, Throw this out to them. Say, hey, what do you think of these two questions? Chat about it. Grow and learn together. And if you're in-house, grab some more coffee and tea. Uh, gather in your social distance groups and, and just ask these questions of each other. And be honest. Be authentic. You might be surprised at what you learn. Okay? So question number one. Have you chosen to follow Jesus? And if you have, why and at what cost? If you've made the choice to follow Jesus at any time in your life, maybe today, why did you make that choice and what will it cost you? Second question, what good thing have you turned into a God thing? Maybe that ended today, but before now, what good thing had you maybe intentionally or accidentally turned into a God thing? How did, how did that happen and what will change now? How will you change that process? How are you making God first again and removing that idol or cutting it out of your life, putting it back in its place? All right? So two big questions, but super important for us to reflect on. Hopefully you have good uh, discussion, conversation with your friends, family, people online, wherever you're at. Uh, next week... Next week is really important. We're going to continue the journey, right? Because we started with looking at the historical Jesus, the Gospels in the first week, and now we've we brought it back in, looking closer at discipleship with Jesus and what it means to truly love God with everything we are. And now we're going to go a little bit closer, and we're going to actually look at the miracles of Jesus. And maybe you're wondering, what? Miracles? Yeah, Jesus performed miracles, real miracles to real people and even today people are experiencing miracles through the power and person of Jesus Christ and through God's spirit whom he gives when we believe in Jesus. So we're going to talk all about that. It's a huge topic so you're not going to want to miss it. If you're able to and you're in house we have some door hangers and some touch cards please, please help us get the word out on this. There are people who need to have these discussions and you hear about this stuff. We want to, whether people are atheist or Christian or anything in between, we want to make sure they have an opportunity to hear this stuff. So either share it online or grab one of those door hangers, a couple of them, do your street or neighborhood, grab a couple of those touch cards, leave them at a restaurant, wherever you're at, and uh, we can get the word out on this and... People can learn and grow together, all right? So thanks so much for those of you who have already been helping and passing stuff around and sharing. That's been amazing. You've been a huge help. So here's the final slide. We're going to leave this up for a few minutes for you to discuss, and we'll see you again next week on the problem of Jesus' miracles. See you then.